Welcome to week eight and the final week of this course. This is the first lesson one, do you know lecture? And there will also be a second lesson two, do you know lecture for this week? So make sure that you finish out both lectures for the week. The aim for this week is to build out a resilience plan for your future and to be able to define organizational resilience. I hope you have realized that to become resilient requires recognizing that we are all capable of gaining control of the decisions we make and the behaviors we engage in, however small they may be. Through our decisions and behaviors, we can take small and sometimes big steps to integrate the various skills, habits, and routines covered in this course. In doing so, we are able to minimize the impact of stress and increase our well-being. During a professional development retreat, I learned about the story of the Man Gulch Fire. The Man Gulch Fire was a wildfire reported in 1949 in a gulch located along the Upper Missouri River. The story goes that a team of 15 smoke jumpers parachuted into the area on the afternoon of August 5, 1949 to fight the fire rendezvousing with a former smoke jumper who was employed as a fire guard at a nearby campground. As the team approached the fire, it began and began fighting it. Unexpected high winds caused the fire to suddenly expand, cutting off the men's route and forcing them back uphill. During the next few minutes, a blow up of the fire covered 3,000 acres in 10 minutes. This fire claimed the lives of 13 firefighters, including 12 of the smoke jumpers. Only three of the smoke jumpers survived. The fire would continue for more than five days before being controlled. The fire started when lightning struck on the south side of Man Gulch. The fire was spotted by a forest ranger and he fought the fire on his own for four hours before he met the crew of smoke jumpers. It was hot, with a temperature of 97 degrees Fahrenheit, and the fire danger rating was high. Wind conditions that day were turbulent. In all, 15 smoke jumpers parachuted into the fire. Their radio was destroyed during the jump, after its parachute failed to open, while other gear and individual jumpers were scattered wildly due to the wind conditions. After the smoke jumpers had landed, a shout was heard coming from the fire, and this was from a, the foreman, Wagner Dodge, and he went ahead to find out that the person shouting was a fire captain, Jim Harrison, who had been fighting the fire by himself for the past four hours. Together, Dodge and Harrison went back to fight the fire. Dodge noted that you could not clo get closer to within 100 feet of the fire due to heat. The rest of the fire crew met Dodge and Harrison about halfway to the fire. Dodge instructed the team to move off the front of the fire and down the gully, crossing back over to the thinly forested and grass-covered north slope of the gulch. By this point, the fire was moving extremely fast up the 37.23 degree slope of Man Gulch, and Dodge realized that they would not be able to make the ridge line in front of the fire. With the fire less than 100 yards behind, he took out a match and set fire to the grass just before them. In doing so, he was attempting to create an escape fire to lie in so that the main fire would burn around him and his crew. In the backdraft of the main fire, the grass set fire and burnt straight up towards the ridge above. Turning to the three men by him, Dodge said, up this way, but the men misunderstood him. The three ran straight up the ridge crest, moving up along the far edge of Dodge's fire. The men later said that he wasn't sure what Dodge was doing and thought perhaps he intended the fire to act as a buffer between the men and the main fire. It was not until he got to the ridge crest and looked 
back that he realized what Dodge had intended. As the rest of the crew came up, Dodge tried to direct them through the fire that he had set into the center burnt out area. Dodge later stated that someone, possibly a squad leader, said, to heck with that, I'm getting out of here. The rest of the team raced past Dodge up the side of the slope towards the ridge of the gulch, hoping that they had enough time to get to the rock ridge line over to safer ground. Unfortunately, none of the men racing up before the fire entered into the fire escape. So the immediate outcome was the four men reached the ridge crest, but only two managed to escape. Like I've mentioned, overall, 13 firefighters passed away, with 11 killed in the fire itself and two sustained fatal burns, and only three of the 16 survived. Through this tragedy, the United States Forest Service drew many lessons. They also designed a new training technique and safety measures that developed how the agency approached wildfire suppression. The agency also increased emphasis on fire research and the science of fire behavior. The reason I'm sharing this story is because it is often analyzed as the interactive disintegration of role structure and sense making in a minimal organized organization. This tragedy occurred, unfortunately, but we can and have learned valuable lessons from what happened, which has enabled the U.S. Forest Service to bounce back from this tragedy and move forward and save many more lives. Some of the lessons we learned from the story of Man Gulch are that immediate solutions may not be the best solution and that a creative and different solution to a problem may work. We also learn about the power of improvisation and its ability to remain creative under stress. Dodge, when starting the fire, did something very unusual and something that had not been done before. His wisdom that he brought led him to be able to improvise in a very stressful situation. Wisdom means avoiding extremes of excessive caution, but also avoiding overconfidence. Also, respectful interaction unfortunately didn't occur during the wild brush fire. And it, this is built on trust and reliability. The men didn't follow Dodge's lead when he was doing something unusual. Lastly, communication is an important lesson. You need effective, timely, and appropriate communication. So looking at this screen, do any of these look familiar? It may be worded a little differently, but all of these items on the screen are lessons that we have learned throughout these eight weeks. How to be creative, how to seek support, how to interact with others, and how to communicate with others in an effective and appropriate way. These are all the lessons of building resilience. For the rest of this lesson, I would like you to think about the roles you have in your organization, the roles you have in your family, and the roles you have in your community. And think about how resilient are these groups. We cannot talk about resilience without addressing the group dynamics. That is why I'm bringing up the Man Gulch story, because it re represents group dynamics. I often feel like this part of the group dynamics is left out of many lessons of resilience. I'm including it here because as human beings, we work with and in multiple systems. We cannot learn personal resilience without considering how our personal resilience works in groups. My observations have led me to believe that just as individuals can learn to develop personal traits of resilience, so too can organizations develop a culture of resilience. 
I would argue that a culture of organizational resilience is built largely upon leadership, what some refer to as resilient leadership. Resilient leadership is shown through demonstrating four core attributes of optimism, decisiveness, integrity, and open communication while serving as conduits and gatekeepers of formal and informal information that flows throughout the organization and while enjoying a high source of credibility. Man Gulch represents four potential sources of resilience that makes groups less vulnerable to disruptions of sense making. This helps postpone disintegration. The sources are improvisation, like we've mentioned, virtual role systems, the attitude of wisdom, and the norms of respectful interaction. The key to developing organizational resilience is making second nature the capability to adapt and recover. In this way, it becomes dynamic, self-organizing, and deeply ingrained into the organization's day-to-day -day operations. And it's a better way of doing business. As stated in the Administrative Science Quarterly, The Collapse of Sensemaking Organizations, The Man Gulch Disaster, Carl writes about the Man Gulch story. He answers the questions, why do organizations unravel and how can organizations be more resilient? The analysis goes on to state, Man Gulch loses its resemblance to a fire and it does so in a way that makes it increasingly hard to socially construct reality. As if the fire were not obstacles enough, it's hard to make common sense when each person sees something differently or nothing at all. The more general point is that organizations can be good at decision making and still falter. They falter because of deficient, deficient sense making. The world of decision making is about strategic rationality. It's built from clear questions and clear answers that attempt to remove ignorance. The world of sense making is different. Sense making is about contextual rationality. It is built out of vague questions, muddy answers, and negotiated agreements that attempt to reduce confusion. People in Man Gulch did not face questions like where we should go, when do we take a stand, or what should our strategy be. Instead, they faced more basic and more frightening feeling that their old labels were no longer working. They were inexperienced and were not sure which way or which direction to go. Until they developed some sense of issues like this, there was nothing to decide and they were paralyzed. In the role structure in Man Gulch, sense making was not the only problem. There was also problems of structure. It seems plausible to argue that a major contributor to this disaster was the loss of the only structure that kept people organized, their role system. The ties and trust were weakened and the sense of danger increased and the means to cope became more primitive. The world rapidly shifted from a general organized structure to chaos and it became emptied of order and rationality. It's intriguing that the three people who survived the disaster did so in ways that seems to forestall group disintegration. Two of them stuck together, their small group of two people did not disintegrate, which helped them keep their fear under control. As a result, they escaped through a crack in the ridge that the others didn't see. Dodge, as the formal leader of the group, ordered his followers to join him in escaping the fire. Dodge continued to see a group and to think about its well-being, which kept his fear under control. 
The rest of the people, however, took less notice of one another. Consequently, the group disintegrated. As their group disintegrated, the smoke, smoke jumpers became more frightened, stopped thinking sooner, and pulled apart even more, and in doing so, lost a leader-follower relationship, as well as access to novel ideas of other people who are a lot like them. As these relationships disappeared, individuals reverted to primitive tendencies of flight. Unfortunately, this response was too simple to match the complexity of the Man Gulch fire. What holds organizations in place may be more tenuous than we realize. The recipe for disorganization in Man Gulch is not all that rare in everyday life. The recipe re reads, thrust people into unfamiliar roles, leave some key roles unfilled, make the task more ambiguous, discredit the role system, and make all of these changes in a context in which small events can combine into something monstrous. Faced with similar conditions, organizations that seem much sturdier may also come crashing down. Much like the Greek god who overreached his competence as he flew towards the sun and also perished because of fire, we are to be resilient if we are to be resilient individuals, we must also identify resilient organizations. Not all organizations are resilient, and as an individual working on building resilient in a non-resilient organization, it can be part of the challenge. When creating your resilience plan, keep this factor in mind. What you can do is actively remember that being resilient is proactive and determined by attitude to remain in a thriving enterprise. Despite anticipated and unanticipated challenges that will emerge. Resilience moves beyond defensive security and protective posture and implies that there is an inherent strength within the organization to withstand crisis and deflect attacks of any nature. Resilience is the empowerment of being aware of your situation, your risks, vulnerabilities, and current capabilities to deal with them, and being able to make informed, tactical, and strategic decisions. Resilience is also measurable and can be seen throughout the organization by looking at specific indicators. An organization that realizes the benefits I just listed, the factors of resilience, will have a high likelihood of maintaining a successful and thriving enterprise. So now on your screen are the individual's factors for resilience. You'll see many commonalities. Do you notice how many of these have to do with other people and organizations? This is why knowing how to influence an organization and what aspects of an organization influence you is so important. I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. This quote by Maya, Maya Angelou, I believe perfectly describes some of our experiences within organizations. A resilient organization is made up of resilient individuals. Resilience comes from learning the organization, changing management, and employee engagement. In a resilient organization, you feel empowered to make decisions, to use your creativity, and to be innovative. If an organization is investing in you, making you feel part of a team, you are more likely to increase your work and your sense of well-being and build resilience. I encourage you once again to look within those organizations you are a part of and see how you can build out your resilience skill set within these organizations. This concludes lesson one. Please continue to review the weekly checklist for this week and we'll see you back again for lesson two.